Well, thank you for uh, the invitation to speak here at SCCM, and thank you um, for uh, coming to hear this talk. Uh, like she said, I work for the Center for Health Security, which is a public health think tank that works on infectious disease emergencies, pandemic preparedness, biosecurity, bioterrorism. I'm both an infectious disease and critical care uh, physician as well. Um, there's my Twitter handle if you'd like to follow me. But what I'm going to do in this talk is try to put this coronavirus into context because you've heard a lot about it, and I'm really going to try and drill down into what, what it means and why this was so important. So what I want to do in this talk is to get you to understand the history of coronavirus infections, both pre-SARS and post-SARS, because that's a real inflection point with coronaviruses. Talk a little bit about some of the members of the coronavirus families, talk about a little bit of COVID-19, there's a typo there, um, and understand the clinical management uh, issues that may come up specifically for the critical care setting. So just to give you a quick snapshot and not to recapitulate everything that Dr. Buckman talked about, what happened with COVID-19 was in mid to late December, a cluster of pneumonia cases, unknown pneumonia cases, unexplained, was found in hospitals in Wuhan. And most of those people had an epidemiological link to an animal market. This was 41 cases. But even if you looked at that initial data set, you knew there was something more to it because patient one, case one, got ill on December 1st and he had no contact with the market. So that's a big red flag. One that tells you, A, this thing had been going on for some time because you've got an incubation period, maybe, maybe six days, maybe up to 14 days. So he got ill in November. So this was circulating in November and he wasn't at the market, which tells you maybe this was in the community for several weeks before it was actually identified. The World Health Organization was notified in late December. So this really had a major head start, uh, even from the outset. What we saw initially was data with people dying, uh, and I just want to draw your attention to even now today when you see some of this data, there's something called a severity bias. They are not testing people with mild illness, so you are seeing people who are going to hospitals and healthcare facilities. So that's going to skew your, your case fatality ratio towards the more severe because we know that there's a spectrum of illness. Even if you look at the cases in the United States, the 15 cases, they are all very mild. So just, be, just interpret those case fatality ratios with, with that in mind. We now know there's human to human spread. The R naught ranges from maybe two to four. We don't know it's gonna shift. This is very early days. And again, mild cases aren't really being accounted for. So we don't know what the transmission characteristics completely are. There's, only, there's actually just been three deaths outside of China. It's not something that we've seen so much outside of China. And that's really interesting, a mystery that we need to figure out what's going on in Hubei province. Why is the death rate so much higher there and elsewhere? We did rapidly find out that this was a beta coronavirus, which is in the coronavirus family, and it fits sort of near SARS, and they're naming the virus SARS-CoV-2. The disease is called COVID-19, the virus is SARS-CoV-2, because it's so genetically linked to SARS. However, it's very different than SARS, and I'll tell you in, in one particular aspect that Dr. Buckman uh, highlighted earlier, I'm going to reiterate that. It seems to be stable in humans. It looks like it was a single introduction, probably from bats to some animal. Uh, the speculation is now on a pangolin, but I'm not sure if that's going to actually uh, basically stick when it, when it gets, uh, when more scientific investigation is done. And we're in the middle of clinical trials and vaccine development. There's over, uh, there's dozens of clinical trials being done in China right now. Remdesivir is one that was mentioned earlier. That's being done in a clinical trial. It was given to the first patient in Washington State here in the United States. People are trying to repurpose HIV protease inhibitors. I'm not sure if that strategy will work. There is a drug called chloroquine, uh, which we use for malaria that may have antiviral therapy. And there's also a drug that Emory is developing called EIDD. 2801, which is an influenza drug, which likely has some activity against coronaviruses. So that's kind of the snapshot. And, you know, you can keep looking at our, at our Johns Hopkins site here and you can get a good idea of what's going on. But again, the theme here is most of these cases are in mainland China. Almost all of the deaths are clustered in mainland China. We have over two dozen countries with imported cases. And it's going to be very interesting to see how this case fatality ratio holds up because we're going to start testing for mild cases now. The CDC is going to be testing in, in places like New York, San Francisco, Chicago, Seattle, in their flu surveillance network. And I think that's really important because coronaviruses have this large spectrum of illness with mild illness being basically the norm. And even in China, 80% of cases are mild and then a very small proportion having severe deaths. So. I think that it's really important to step back from all the headlines and scare, scary news about coronaviruses and talk about what if I was giving this talk to you on coronaviruses in 2000? Probably there would be nobody in the room uh, if I was giving you the talk uh, in 2000. But really it starts with the common cold. And we know that the common cold is caused by multiple different viruses. And well, the ones that were initially described were flu, adenovirus, rhinovirus, paraflu, RSV. 
But what was clear that there was one third of cases where they couldn't find any, any virus or any bacteria, but you could take the snot from that person, literally, and give it to somebody else, give them a tissue inoculated into their nose, and they would get sick. So there was some other, some other organism there. And what ended up happening was in 1960, they, they, they did an experiment on a boy with the cold, and he could transmit symptoms, that, and the secretions were able to pass through a bacterial filter. It was inactivated by ether. They couldn't figure out what it was, and they described, they found a new viral, car, a new viral particle growing in human embryonic tracheal organ cultures. Coronaviruses are notoriously hard to grow, and they named it B814. So in 1965, that was when coronaviruses came to light as the first new common cold virus. And then in 1967, it was followed by the second one, OC43. So the first one, they called it, this one actually is 229E right now in, in modern nomenclature, and then OC43 in 1967. And they found these viruses everywhere. And if anybody of you, any of you are on farms, they, they have bovine coronaviruses, porcine coronaviruses. So it infects lots of different mammals, which is really important for when we think about it as a pandemic threat, that it has many animal hosts, and they all likely are harbored in bats. And they call it a coronavirus because it looks like it has a little crown um, the, uh, on it, this projecting part of a, a classic cornice was the first use of the word corona. Uh, in, I looked it up in the dictionary, but that's where, that's where the name comes from. And there are two subfamilies. It's just important to know there's alpha, beta, and gamma coronaviruses in the coronavirinae family, and it's the, the beta coronaviruses is where you see SARS or MERS, the, no, the novel coronavirus, are all in there. Most of the time, they cause just mild viral URIs and some GI symptoms. It is a single-stranded RNA viruses. In general, RNA viruses are our biggest pandemic threats, as you heard earlier, and it has the largest RNA viral genome. So what's the epidemiology of common cold viruses that, that are uh, common colds and, and coronaviruses cause, causing common colds? It's worldwide, winter and spring. That's when you see coronavirus season. That's why you've started to hear people talk about maybe as weather gets warmer in the northern hemisphere, this may die down, because we do know that that happens with our seasonal coronaviruses. And they cause about a quarter of the common cold. So we have a lot of data on those common cold causing coronaviruses. Reinfection is common. We know that for our own experiences, and many people get multiple common colds even during the same season. And so antibodies are not sterilizing. Most commonly occurs in children and about half of people become ill. So some people can be asymptomatically infected. It, it's clear that they shed the virus. It's unclear how infectious they are. That's become a major uh, point of contention now with this novel coronavirus, asymptomatic shedding. And there are something called super spreaders, which we really came, came to light with SARS. And what a super spreader is, is some, it really reflects heterogeneity and pathogen transmission. Somebody that spreads and infects more people than, than the average person. And that's why the R0 is misleading, because some person's R0 might be one, and someone's R0 might be four. And one of them might be a super spreader, one of them might not be a super spreader. And there's this thing called the 20-80% rule. So 20% of the people are going to be, account for 80% of the infections. That's what we see with, with, with some of these, uh, what we saw with SARS. And it's also seen with HIV, typhoid, you all know the very famous uh, super spreader typhoid Mary, and tuberculosis. And when you look at SARS, it's R0 fell to 2.7 when you took out the super spreader. So this was really key to what, how SARS got around. And many of those super spreaders actually had a runny nose, which kind of makes sense from a symptomatic standpoint that that's more likely to expose you to respiratory secretions. But one of the other things about SARS, and I think we're seeing this now with the novel coronavirus, was the Chinese government's response to SARS made it much, much worse. This was something that was discovered, but then kind of kept quiet for a while in military hospitals and a major head start for the virus. And these are some of the editorial cartoons from around the time of SARS. After SARS, people started thinking differently about coronaviruses. They thought these are pandemic threats, they're not just common cold viruses. And they discovered a couple new coronaviruses after SARS. One is called NL63, I won't talk about that, but I just wanna draw your attention to HKU1. They found this in a man in China in 2004 who had pneumonia. And then they started looking at bank samples of people who were sick with SARS that had a presumed sick, uh, a SARS diagnosis, and they actually found HKU1 was circulating along with SARS. They looked in the United States, they found it in the United States. They looked in Cleveland, um, and, I, and I'm from Pittsburgh, so nobody likes to look for anything in Cleveland there, but, it, but uh, in Cleveland, they found it in specimens there of severely ill patients on mechanical ventilators. They found HKU1, and nobody knew anything about it, and it was causing people to have ARDS. 
So I think this is really interesting because it maybe gives you an idea of what could have happened with this virus. If you, you want to know in China, was this there before and just mixed in with colds and flus and no one tests, you know, you can go to any ICU and like, that guy's got a viral pneumonia, that guy's got a viral pneumonia. Nobody's ever figured out they do the biofire test, but if it's not on that panel, you don't know what caused it. So I just draw your attention to HKU1 because I think that's a really good parallel to think about. We talked a little bit about the clinical features um, with coronaviruses, pneumonia and more severe diseases, much more likely in the immunosuppressed, the elderly and infants. SARS, which is the, the touch point for this novel coronavirus, 8,000 cases, 800 deaths, 25% had ARDS and the mortality was 10%. This is something that was a little bit different than what we're seeing now. Our mortality rate numbers are around one to 2% with the severity bias. But look at SARS's case count, 8,000 versus over about 70,000. What SARS could not do is transmit efficiently from human to human. What SARS relied on was poor infection control. Once people understood how to treat these patients safely and how to protect their staff, SARS disappeared. This virus is spreading more like the common cold cause, causing coronaviruses. So that's why this is not something that we believe is containable. This had been going on since November, at least in China, and you give a respiratory virus a head start like that, you cannot contain it, just like H1N1 could not be contained. So that's really important to remember as this debate shifts. In SARS, they used a lot of different drugs, and I won't belabor them. Nothing really worked out. Some people were interested in some HIV drugs. Uh, some people were giving steroids, which actually probably made people worse. But the point about SARS was this happened in 2003, and this is 17 years later, and we have no coronavirus countermeasures. This is the problem with emerging infectious disease countermeasures. Nothing except, nobody except for BARDA really actually invests in them, and that's why we're left with, with nothing on the table right now. A couple of other things to talk about SARS. We, we talked about, uh, Dr. Buckman talked a little bit about the link between bats to civet cats. Just remember that coronaviruses all circulate in bats, so that's where they're always going to be. And, we, and after they actually stopped eating the civet cats and figured out how to do infection control, SARS disappeared. And since SARS disappeared, there's only been a few cases that were really just linked to, to lab errors most of the time and a few little sporadic cases, but it's gone. And that's why vaccine development disappeared. That's a picture of a raccoon dog, which is one of the other hosts that they thought about there. We did have eight cases of SARS in the United States. Many people forgot about those eight cases. I just list them there for your benefit. You'll be able to get these probably online on the app. But there were cases, including in my home state of Pennsylvania, many people who had traveled and, and, got, uh, and got exposed. The Hotel Metropole, which is one of the major focal points with the SARS outbreak, played a role there as well with the U.S. cases. But in the United States, we had eight SARS patients in nine hospitals with 110 healthcare workers. 45 healthcare workers had exposure without any mask use and did not get infected. So I think that's really an important point to make, that we, we got lucky with, with SARS. Touch on Middle East Respiratory Syndrome very quickly. Um, this is the one that spreads from bats to camels to humans in the Arabian Peninsula since 2012. And they found fatal respiratory illness in Saudi Arabia. Uh, they basically identified this in a, in a Qatari national that was treated in the UK. They isolated the virus. And then they found out that this was present for some time. Even in April 2, 2012, they found it in this unexpected cluster of healthcare workers in Jordan that got sick. So this clearly, again, is another theme with coronaviruses. And even though we might discover them, it doesn't mean that they weren't there before. And this has been in 26 countries, uh, in, including the United States. And this has about a 35% case fatality rate. But again, like SARS, it does not transmit well between human to human, which limits its spread. And people have forgotten a lot about MERS, but these are, some of the ca these are some of the cartoons that people really were worried about MERS taking off like SARS did, but it clearly hasn't, but there are cases accruing even, even in the last week, there are new cases in Saudi Arabia of MERS, but it just doesn't transmit efficiently from human to human. That's the, that's the issue with it. When you look, this is just where MERS fits. It was also in the beta coronavirus family near, near SARS, uh, and that's why people are very focused on this uh, um, on, on this branch of the coronavirus family. Again, this is something that came from bats and they found antibodies in camels and they realized that this was a camel-human interaction that was causing this virus to, uh, to spread into humans. And MERS is an interesting lesson because they did get an imported case in South Korea that led to 186 cases and 36 deaths with massive nosocomial outbreaks. So again, infection control is very important in ICU settings and in regular hospital settings when you're dealing with coronaviruses. And uh, this really, the government of South Korea lost a lot of confidence based on how they handled that MERS case. We did have two cases in the United States. They were both really uh, very mild cases, and uh, they, they didn't really have any, they didn't have any secondary transmission. They were handled very well. They didn't need to be hospitalized, so we did have an experience with MERS back in 2014, which many people have forgotten about. 
So a couple of things I want to end on in the critical care themes because I have a critical care, care audience here. Like I said before, we have an unclear severity picture. You can see some horrible CAT scan pictures there, but remember these are severity bias skewed samples. You're seeing people who are presenting to hospitals. We do know that you're going to think about when you, what, what I think is going to happen is we're going to get a surge of patients with this coronavirus, some of whom are going to need critical illness. So I think it's really important that hospitals start preparing now and start thinking about this, dusting off their pandemic influenza plan, thinking about mechanical ventilation issues, how you're going to do that um, if, you, if you get a run on your ventilators, especially if you're in a small hospital. What kind of supply chain do you have? What's your ICU bed capacity? How are you going to deal with rescue modalities? So for example, in China, they've used ECMO on some patients. Do you have an ECMO program or are you going to use ECMO if we have have a few, if you have cases sporadically with this. Uh, think about infection control. How many airborne isolation rooms are in your ICU? And uh, think about how you might trial an experimental antivirals, which we did with 2009 H1N1. This, didn't, this, this should go down. But if you can look here, the, some of these ICU patients, it's, it's not really projecting well because the CAT scan is blocking. But the Apache 2 average score is 17 uh, there, and the average SOFA score was 4 which gives you some idea of where, where these patients sit. But sometimes the onset of symptoms to ICU admission is 10 days, so that's kind of interesting. It's a more of a prolonged illness. Just to remind you of 2009 H1N1, uh, that there were 61 million cases in the United States with 274,000 hospitalizations with about 30% admitted to an ICU, 38% developed ARDS uh, uh, of the patients admitted to the ICU, of the, of the deaths, 24% died. And patients who received anti-treatment less than two days after onset 20% less likely to develop ARDS and 22% less likely to die. So just, we've been through this before and we, we dealt with H1N1 and we actually used really interesting modalities like ECMO, for example. In the Southern Hemisphere, one third of mechanically ventilated patients received ECMO and had a 20% mortality. And in the UK, 55% decrease in mortality just by referring someone to an ECMO center. So that's really important that you think about what you're gonna do for your severely ill patients if you don't have the resources at your hospital. And 4 to 9% of mechanically ventilated patients required ECMO uh, during H1N1, so we were able to handle it. Uh, and some of the, my colleagues at the center, we actually tried to, to sell this as, a, as an approach to, to, um, to thinking about pandemics and using the concept of severe lung injury centers where they could do ECMO. So just a couple last slides. What is it about coronaviruses? Multiple mammalian hosts. This has, it has, it's a virus, it has the ability to recombine, it has the ability to move from host to host. There's a worldwide epidemiology spread through the respiratory route. Uh, bats are a massive species that can do a lot more, uh, can, can spread a lot of viruses very far. A couple of predictions. I think this is going to become the fifth seasonal coronavirus. I don't think that this is going to uh, be something that's containable. I think it's going to circulate along, our other, along with our other coronaviruses. And I also think, like many pandemics, that the reaction will be worse uh, than the virus. It's the, it's the government actions that are being taken that are not science-based that are going to magnify the impact, the economic losses, and the societal disruption from this virus. So thank you. Um, again, I hope that was useful, and it was a whirlwind tour of the coronavirus, but I, I think that hopefully gave you some context.